Yes, people, welcome back. Fully booked. Um, we're here season 10 um, with myself, Mace. Myself, French. And myself, Andrew. And this season, we're going to be reviewing a book called Minimalism by Live, Live a Meaningful Life. By They call themselves The Minimals, but it's Joshua Fields and Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. Now, one of the reasons we chose to review this book, Minimalism, is because of what's going on in the current climate. So as you're well aware, worldwide, COVID-19 has pretty much cancelled everyone's 2020 and many people have lost loved ones. One of the things we wanted to do with this season was to review a book which we felt would um, not necessarily benefit, but it's definitely come to the forefront of most people's lives, realising what is actually important in life, whether it's health, relationship, family, and actually the fact that they've had to probably had to minimalise their, their kind of life, their kind of things they do this year because of what's going on with COVID. So that's why we chose this book. Um, without further ado, French P, do you want to give a little insight into the book? Uh, I won't give it insight. We'll, we'll just go through it. And I guess once we've done the book review, then we can uh, discuss the inner workings of the uh, authors and the book itself. But I'll start from the intro. Yes. And the first thing that I picked up on was on page one, where it says, conformity is a drug with, me with many people self-medicate. Not happy, buy this, buy that, or buy something. At what point do you think that we start to conform? Do you, know, do you know what's crazy? I could even show you my notes. I had the same thing written down. Yeah. Same thing, yeah. And what I was going to say, and my answer to that, for, for me, is yeah. before you even know you're conforming, you started to conform. Before you even know it. And when I say that, I mean, I mean that to say this. I don't know. Um, immediately, you're, for the first few years of your life, you're learning directly from uh, family, whether it's your parents, um, extended family, aunties, uncles, grandparents, cousins. You're kind of, the way your, your environment affects you, whether it's cartoons you watch as well, it's all part of kind of shaping you to conform to a certain society. And then this leads into your schooling life as well, where the schooling system is shaped around a, a working day almost. You start up at nine, you, you, I think you finish off at three and then it graduates to five by the time you hit college or university. And it's all shaping you to conform within a society. Media plays a huge role in that. So I think your brain and the way you are the way you behave, you start to conform from an age that you can't even appreciate you're conforming to society's norms and values. Um, so I can't give it that actual time specific, but before you even know, before you're having the chance to really evaluate what's going on in and around you in the world, you'll be, you're starting to conform. What's your guys' thoughts? Well, I was going to say the same thing, to be fair. <laughs> literally the same thing. My answer was going to be, from the moment that you're born, you're literally conforming because you're... By the time, as you said, before you even realise what age and number it is, you're yeah. already in a, in a, I guess, in a motion when like, you start crying. You know, if you start crying as a baby, you get attention. So you're already conforming to so, not social pressures, but just social roles in terms of how you behave. If a certain behaviour is manifested, then you know that a certain, another action is going to be uh, reciprocated as well. So... I think from the moment that you're born, you're conforming to, to society as, as you rightly put. Yeah. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree any more, obviously, with yourself, Mason, if I'm honest. Um, I think that conformity, or no, I think conformity obviously begins, obviously, um, when you're young, but I think you actually understand you're conforming um, when you're probably, probably like in, the, in, in your teens, in high school. I think when you start like attaining cultural standards and you sometimes you get kids and children, students who are then not happy and some people um, suffer with things like depression as we know and then some people start going against the grain and then you start having different fractions let's say in in school and, and at that point in life and I think it begins then and then it manifests into something else differently. Cool oh, that, that moves us really well on to the next point that I, I picked up on which is on page two and it says the truth is that nearly all the pressure we feel is completely internal. Sure, this is pressure. This pressure is influenced by external factors, but that doesn't mean we have to take the bait. Now, would you say this is not easier said than done? Yeah, and once again, I've got the same notes. Like, whilst you were reading from your notes, French, I held up my screen because I've got the same notes. And my question on that was almost how do you rebel against feeling this pressure and what do you do to relieve yourself of this pressure and stress? Now, in relation to um, 
your question, sorry, French, was it, what was it, sorry, it was, um, how is it not easier said than done, basically? 100%, 100%, man. I think, um, I think it, 100% man, like, how can I put it? If I relate it to myself, you kind of, I'm at a stage now where I'm in a life whereby if I was to try and get, and we'll get further into this as the book progresses, but if I was to just say tomorrow to everyone in and around my social circle, not you guys, but like other social circles, like other social circles, my family, my missus, if I was to say, do you know what? I'm giving up this life, tomorrow I'm just gonna walk the streets for a week because that's gonna make me happy and truly happy, yeah? The amount of like, the, the internal pressure I'd feel based on that would be like, I'm letting this person down. Is this right? Like, it's it's a lot. It's And it's very hard. And the book, I know the book's about minimalism, about kind of living a meaningful life, what's true to you. It's not, it's easier said than done. It's not that easy. And the pressure to conform, as we mentioned before, it's a, it's a high pressure, man. It's very high. And I think, especially when we've been mentally trained or mentally attuned to conform from an early age, Imagine it's taking, I don't know how many years of conformity, 15, 18, 21, whatever it is, it's, it's going to be different to each individual. But to unwind that, unravel that conformity is not easy. It's, I would argue it's going to take, it's, it's like one year forward, one year back. So maybe it'll take the same amount of time to, to come out of that. Reading books, speaking, having these kind of dialogues and discussion, being around people who don't conform, which is one of the things they're going to talk about as well, where they met people who actually lived the life that maybe they don't desire, but a life whereby they don't feel the, the kind of social pressures having that group, introducing that group into your life, that's probably some of the items or factors or things that will help you to come out of that, of that feeling where you've got internal pressure and external pressure. So yeah, it's kind of dilly dally with the answer, but you kind of get my point. Yeah, um, I, yeah I, mean, I understood your point. I think your point was well said. Um, I think it's easier said than done, but it requires acquiring knowledge and experience. And as it says in the book, I think the first step is obviously the hardest, but the problem you have when you're, that age and when you're young and if I'm kind of like linking it to being a teenager at that point and at that point in that time you're kind of looking for instant gratification so things such as clothes drugs food well not food but I mean clothes and drugs and things of that nature and when you're attaining cultural standards it can be very very difficult to kind of get yourself out of that mold so yeah I think it's easier said than done hence why it takes several years in actually getting to know yourself and learn 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 who you are before you can actually break that mold. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I second what both of you say. I, I noted down personally that um, we as humans are social. As we know, we're in the lockdowns and not everyone has been sticking to the rules per se because we are social animals. We like to, we like to gather, we like to be around each other. So to then step out and be on your own kind of, be on your own kind of thing, so to speak, it's like, it's like social suicide. You're literally going to be, you're in one group or you, you're attached to one group. We may be attached to three or four groups. And if you have to turn your back on those said three or four groups, you're literally going to be on your own, which, as I said, is like having social suicide. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of echoing what you both said. Yeah. Just to, before you move on, French, I just wanted to, what I forgot to do at the beginning was, I did say that this book, Minimalism, is, a, is by Joshua, well, I called him Joshua Ryan, that's for sure. But I think the pr premise of why they've kind of produced or written this book and what it's about is the fact that they were both mid-20 guy, guys in the mid-20s who had everything, um, living what they thought was a meaningful life, six-figure jobs, cars, girls, houses, marriage, some of them, um, I think both or one was, both were married young. And then they basically come to realisation that they weren't truly happy internally and then thought, how can we get out of this? What's important to us? Wrote this, they, they started to live a more minimalistic life and eventually it's led to them writing this and, and, and other books. Cool. Yeah. Uh, did you want to ask your question? I noticed that you noted down the question as well. Myself? Yeah, just yeah. How, how do you like, so you, we touched on pressure. How can you rebel against feeling this pressure? I mean, do you, I know both of you personally and I know that with both of you, you're now at a point in life where you don't feel any type of pressure to, to conform to, or you feel very little pressure to conform to social norms and values, and also even expectations family members and friends might have of you. You're, you're, you're like of that ilk now. But how would the regular, like maybe into yourselves, but how would the regular person, how do you think they could rebel against feeling this pressure? And if they do feel this pressure, what, what do you guys do and what can you do to relieve yourself of this pressure and stress? You want to go first, French? 
Do you say it like? No, I was gonna say, do you mind if I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Cool. So no, like I actually, when you actually asked that question, um, when you were speaking initially, I actually wrote one or two things down, and that's yeah. why I kind of included it in my answer. And as I said, it requires like acquiring knowledge and experience, and and actually learning about yourself. And my own experience were probably very similar to the stuff I said. Like you're you're 13, 14, 15, you're in those teenage years where you're with your groups, or you're with your friends, you're in different groups, and you're having a good time. But at the same time, you might have conflicting thoughts as to not necessarily friends, but as to just information you're receiving and you begin questioning things as to what you want to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it took me several years um, before actually, and in fact, it took me till probably the age of like 27, if I'm honest, like late, late, late 20s before I actually understood and knew myself very, very well. I'm definitely going to be touching on traveling <laughs> in, in this. Traveling? <laughs> in, in, traveling? Yeah. No, see that don't go by with this brother don't make I'm definitely traveling. Gonna be touching on traveling as to as to because actually as to traveling as as that's what um I think one if not both of them both traveled as well so yeah it took me to actually understand and know myself before I became very very comfortable in not necessarily having 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 pressure in agreeing to or following like social norms I couldn't give a monkey's about some social norms as I've mentioned to you actually recently. I've got no problem in receiving critique um, by way of friends and family as to something I'm doing wrong. That I will not necessarily take to heart, but I will genuinely listen to that. But as to listening to social norms or critique from, let's say, Instagram or, or Twitter, I couldn't care less. That, that has nothing that I'm not really fussed about, um, things of the nature whatsoever. I follow my own norms. I have my own ideals, and which I believe are quite pure, and I'll, and I'll follow them, obviously, with my heart. Um, my perspective is, uh, it's been a process. It's not been, I've just woke up like this. It's, as you said before, rightly so, like you, you've become aware of com like conforming to social norms and it takes twice as long, if not the same amount, to come out of those social norms. So I would definitely say it's a process, but in terms of anyone that's, that, that is kind of struggling with that, I would say you've got to be you've got to be happy by yourself at times because when you're by yourself, you're able to experiment and find out what you actually like to do, what your personal views are and how you take on uh, whether it's a problem or a situation. You've got to be able to be strong-minded enough to sit in a room by yourself or go on holiday by yourself or whatever it may be, go cinema by yourself, go to eat. Like, I do all that shit by myself. Like, I could go... Nando's and sit and eat a food. Like I used to do that all the time. I come out of the gym, eat a food by myself, and able to have thinking time by myself. And I think that played a, a big part in me being able to realize who I am as a person and not be kind of conforming to what my social circles was saying to do and not to do. So it's definitely a process, but I would definitely advise to be able to at least be by yourself. If, it doesn't have to be all day and all night and all week, but just even if it's an hour or two, just be able to sit and have your own thoughts without anyone interjecting or putting any kind of their their viewpoint on what your thing is. So even if you, for example, you read an article in a newspaper and you think about what you what what's your thoughts on it, like not get someone else's opinion and have a conversation. Think about it have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and maybe write down your answer and see if that's an answer that you still agree with half an hour later. Or if you go and have a conversation and then discuss that same problem. And if you come back and your answer is still the same, then you know you're on the track of, okay, well, this is my mindset and this is how I feel about it. And yeah, I can take on other people's uh, perceptions or their viewpoints, but this is how I feel about a particular subject. So I would definitely advise to take some time out for yourself and um, yeah, get to know yourself. Um, moving on in regards to happiness, because as, as we mentioned, this is a book about trying to live a meaningful life. Now, they say that real happiness comes from within. Likewise, discontentment is also a result of who we've become. How do you pursue happiness? Question. Um, okay. um, me, um, I don't know. I, I, we have these conversations quite quite often. 
I'm quite clear with what I want. So, and that's how I kind of pursue happiness. Sometimes I think you can be um, quite hard on yourself or, or over-disciplined um, as to some of the things and goals you're trying to achieve. But as it says in the book, I think sometimes you need to find a way to make it a bit more enjoyable and enjoying the process, um, among other things, is, is what I try to do. Um, but at the same time, within my goals and the things that I want to achieve, that's not who I am entirely. Andrew is more than more than X, you know, I encompass so many different things, you know, so um, in those other things is where I also find enjoyment. That's a good question, French. It's, hard, it's a hard one for me to answer. And I'm, content makes me happy. Um, just being content. When I think about visualizing or even in the book, even we'll touch upon this, but it talks about listing down um, items of, of kind of happiness. And I think about that. Traveling makes me happy. Uh, my family and friends make me happy. Um, I think th we're touching it. There's a lot of things I don't agree with, but, but one of the things I do agree with is money is not the be all and end all. And it, it often, it, it actually talks about a lot of things I often talk about where you need money in this world. It's the society we've been raised in. We're not living in the, I don't know, whatever God knows century where you could, where you could um, exchange animals or farming products or whatever it is, or, now it's it's all about that, that the cash, you know what I mean? And at the moment, um, not being able to travel in this current environment doesn't make me happy. I know that I'm a man that I like to go and experience new cultures, see new things um, and new experiences. That's the kind of things that make me happy. Um, how do I pursue it? Book a holiday, but it, it's, it's always, with a holiday, with traveling, it, it's always a short, not a short-lived moment, but it's like a break from the norm. And I think I'm still working towards trying to, pursue that ultimate happiness where every day is a day of happiness and joy. So that's where I am with it. I think we've, we've lost French, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. But just, just touching on your, on your point, like as to myself and traveling, like what, what happened when I went away? Because traveling and going on holiday are slightly two different things. When I went away, you actually had to strip down some, you had to strip down a lot of things. And then once those things were stripped down, you realize, or I realized I was carrying a lot of baggage by way of conforming to certain things. And then once you actually realize this is a better way of living. Not that I had no choice, but I couldn't pretend I didn't know no different than I did before. And then it kind of like, I don't want to say summarizes or validates my point. I think it requires acquiring knowledge and experience before understanding, actually, I don't want to go in, down that path anymore. I want to go down this path. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one, man. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can get French back. And... Yeah. I'll just, what I'll do is whilst, whilst um, we're trying to get French back, because um, I'm sure he's going to move on, start moving on to the chapters because we kind of discussed around the introduction. One, with the book, there's five common principles or themes they say to focus on to live a meaningful or minimalistic life. And those five themes, which are kind of chaptered out in the book, um, relate to uh, five fundamental values, sorry. The five fundamental values are health, relationships, passions, growth, and contribution. And I'm sure we're going to touch upon them as well. And it's about living, and these all relate to living deliberately and living with a meaning. And I had a question on that, but I'll wait for French to, um, to re-emerge. Oh, in regards to uh, how, how to pursue, how do I pursue happiness? For me personally, it's just doing, doing things that I enjoy. I don't think happiness is a permanent state. For you to appreciate happiness, you have to be able to know what sadness is. Mm. So, so yeah, I don't think it's a, a a constant. Okay, I've got to this point in my life, and now I'm just going to be happy. So, but by doing things that I enjoy, whether that's talking to you guys, doing this podcast, whether it's going to the gym, working out, uh, going for walks, listening to music, chilling, wherever it like. There's many many facets to to what I do that I enjoy. For I enjoy, I do and enjoy, and that what makes me happy. So it's a number of things. It's definitely a number of things. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't think you should pursue happiness per se. I think you should just be involved in what you like to do and and continue doing it because you're always going to have uh, a time where you're not going to be happy. So for you to be pursuing that happiness and not, and if you're not be able to, to capture that happiness, then that's just going to make it 10 times worse if you don't always feel the state of happiness. Uh, yeah, so like 
And to almost back up what I was saying, they, they mentioned something as happiness as being a byproduct. And this is on a point on page eight where they say, we must stop searching for happiness and instead start looking for meaning. If our short-term actions align with our long-term values, we'll find purpose in whatever we're doing. So living deliberate, deliberate, deliberately. Not ephemeral or fleeting happiness, but lasting contentment that is reinforced by a life of discipline, attention, awareness, and intentional, intention, intentionality. Happiness is merely a byproduct. Now, uh, it, it moves on slightly in regards to our anchors. Uh, when we mean anchors, I mean things like our house payments, our car payments, uh, whether it's gym memberships, uh, cinema, whatever it may be, you're, you're something that weighs you down and keeps you in a position that you are at the moment. So I just want to touch on that, base, that briefly and we can go into a question after. So it, it, it describes anchors on page 17 and they've described it as major mortgage payments, car payments, toxic relationships, uh, major debts, our careers, minor, minor uh, attachments or minor anchors being cable bills, internet, mobile phones, other bills, unproductive peripheral relationships, smaller tasks that don't really require our attention. Now the question being, if you consider some of your anchors as a necessity, would you still drop them if you wanted to pursue minimalism? Um, no, <laughs> sorry, go on. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Um, no, if it's a necessity, then no, I wouldn't drop them. And I mean, in the book it says, obviously, minim minim minimalism is... Is, 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 I mean, not it's not for everyone, but it's different for everybody. So for me, if something was a necessity, then I'd keep it. But if it's not a necessity, then I'll remove it. So for example, um, we spoke about, see, during this time, I felt Netflix, which is a great tool for information and ent entertainment. Um, I like it. It's cheap. It's not expensive. It's not of a huge outlay to me. But because I felt it was distracting me, I removed it certainly short term so I can actually focus my attention elsewhere. So for me, if it's not a necessity and it's an anchor, I'll get rid of it. Not a problem. I won't even blink twice. Mm. Yeah, echoing what Poker said, I was going to say exactly the same thing. If something's a necessity, um, but at the same time, it's tying me in or tying me down to a position where I can't freely move about, but it is a necessity, then the necessity must stay. That's my opinion. Um, but I even... Yeah. To it. Sorry, French, go on. Yeah, no... To be fair, echo, echoing the same, I, I, I don't want to make it sound too boring where I'm just echoing what you're saying and vice versa. But that is the reality. Um, if it is necess a necessity, then it will stay. Um, but yeah, what was you going to continue with what you were going to say? No, I was, I was going to touch on the whole thing of clothes and like um, even, even gadgets. So like, I used to be an individual who, I, not that I was looking for instant gratification, but like I, I took... Um, I don't know, it, there was a feel good factor about maybe buying clothes and buying things of the nature. But like once you get a bit older and again, you acquire knowledge and a bit of experience and uh, experience, sorry, gather knowledge and experience, you understand there's no, there's no need for that. I mean, what I'll find and in particular in this time in the summer, if you were to remove um, the lockdown and the virus and things of nature, people are going to be out shopping on a day like this on a Saturday, consuming, consuming goods, buying clothes to enjoy the summer. Nothing wrong with that. But I tell you this, this is what is what I learned anyway. The moment summer finishes, boom, all my summer clothes get put in a, in a box. There's no need for them to come out for another nine months, 10 months, because we know we don't get a summer here anyway. But the problem some people have is they buy in season. So like, me, me, for me, a white t-shirt and a black t-shirt is going to be in season every single year. But for some people, Gucci this, Gucci this month is not Gucci next month. Mm. I mean, and I don't have I don't have those issues, you know. I don't feel the, the need. It's not a need, you know. It's not it's, it's not necessary. It's not necessary, um, for me to consume those things. Those things are only going to weigh me down financially and in other aspects of my life as well. Oh, mate. Right. What I was going to say is, um, you said you, one of the things you one of the things you said I didn't disagree. Everything else I did. One of the things you said was when you get a bit older. I don't even think it's down to age. You've got forty year old man out there still trying to keep up with the latest Gucci bar that's come out. So I don't think it's an age thing. I honestly think it's an experience thing. And I think it's almost a knowledge thing and where your mindset's at. Because honestly, a lot of the whole thing where, and people should be down if they want. I wanted to keep up with the fucking Joneses when it comes to clothes. That is superficial shit, innit? 
And I think like, I feel like if that's your, your mentality or, or how you're moving, then it's because you haven't reached a deeper level within yourself. You don't have enough people around you can, you can, you can, um, you can have a deeper conversation with. And a lot of that is down to traveling. Because when you go out and see other cultures, bro, and you like witness what real fucking, sorry, language, real poverty is when you've seen it with your eyes, the slums that people are living in, and you see how happy people are with the minimal stuff they have when you've been to certain countries and you see the happiness they still have because they know what's relevant and important in life. That's when it, my mind changed. Like, I couldn't give a shit. Every, see this, bro. I bought this about seven, eight years ago. A lot of my clothes now are old, bro. Like, they're old. I just reuse them. And a lot of the time, honestly, the last time, I've never stepped into, like, a trainer shop and bought anything new. I go online. If I need a new pair of trainers, I go online. I hit one of them outlet centers. I'm looking for three seasons ago because guess what? Now it's out of season. It's going to be back in because I'm rocking it now. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> and no, no one else has it, bro. Like, that's how I see it. I, I go straight to the sales section. I don't do, I don't do an S, bro. Trainers are there to, to serve two or three purposes. One, comfort to my feet. Two, to be able to walk the street with, yeah? That's the main purpose. And three, the, like the byproduct. Yeah, look good with the outfit I'm wearing or whatever. I get why sometimes people have to keep, not keep up, sorry, have to make sure that they look prim and pristine. If you're a news presenter or you're constantly in the public eye, then yeah, you have a, it might go with your whole character or personality. This person's flamboyant, they've always got this out, a different outfit that's flamboyant. I get that in it. But when you're just trying to keep up with the latest ongoings, your big 38 year old, two kids at home and a woman, and then you're trying to go out and, and um, Kanye West dropped the new Yeezy 4s and you're queuing up at four in the morning for them. Come on, man, let's get <laughs> into it, let's be real in it. You know what I'm saying? And in that respect, yeah, I live a minimalism life in terms of, Clothing, like material stuff like clothing. Gadgets, same thing, bro. Like, similar to you. It's not... French, you just said it yourself. I don't know if you caught that on or off camera. I'm the same, bro. And it's, it's a little bit of a downfall. Technology is not my strong point. Can my phone make a call? Can I send a message? That's all I need, bro. I, that's why man has an iPhone from about 10 years ago. Because I'm not going to make use of the latest iPhone. Mm -hmm. Can I make a call? Can I get by? Does it have GPS? Whatever, like little essentials. I don't need to keep up with these things. If you work in IT, I get that. You will keep up with the latest trends in IT. It's, 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 your, it's, your, um, it's your job or it's your profession. You have to. If you're, do you know what I'm saying? If you're a lecturer in IT or whatever it is. So it's kind of, as you said, Pete, it depends on the person. It depends on the person. It depends on um, what's important to that person. It depends on what, if it's important. Like, it it's different for each person, minimalism and what's important and what's not. I was going to say, as you were thinking, as, as you were speaking, I, 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 a thought arose where, what if having those new clothes and a new phone is what makes that person or that individual happy? Like, them having that, them being able to show other people is what gains their happiness. That makes them happy. That's what drives them to keep on pursuing whatever it is that they're pursuing. Do you, do, you, do you think that's a problem? Personally, I feel if that's what's making you happy, it's very superficial, and I think you need to. I think you need a deeper, deep. You need to get a deeper meaning to life in your system. That's personally what I think, isn't it? But if you're a fashion designer, that's the better term I should have used. If you're a fashion mm -hmm. designer, or if you're massively into fashion, then I get that because it's part of your DNA almost. Like that's, and I get what you're saying, um, French. That's what makes you happy. But going out chasing the latest products when there's so much more life experiences out there to be had, it's just something that doesn't, that doesn't resonate with me in it. And I just feel like that kind of materialistic stuff, if that's the only thing that's making you happy, showing off, saying, wow, right, look at me, I've got this. And like, look at what I've got. And that's the only thing that's soon gonna fade. Because as P said, the season changes every three, three months, is it? Every, in line with the seasons. Yeah. So you gotta keep keeping up with that. Once that gets taken away from you, Where's your deeper meaning or understanding of life? Where's your kind of inner happiness? Where's your inner momentum to go and want to strive and achieve more outside of the superficial materialistic items that life has to offer? That's just, yeah, that's where I'm at with that.